The deep ocean is home to some of the most bizarre and alien-like creatures on Earth. From squid that look like vampires to creatures that resemble goblins, deep-sea animals are unlike anything we've ever seen. Stay with me now, we're going to take a look at the most bizarre creatures ever found in the ocean. The deep ocean is one of the least understood ecosystems on Earth, mainly because it's so remote, and it's too extreme and hostile for most forms of life to exist. These conditions, which are caused by the lack of sunlight, the intense pressures, and relative lack of food, pose unique challenges for survival, and has meant that creatures that do live there have to evolve highly specialized adaptations. The main influence on life in the deep ocean compared to nearer the surface or on land is the darkness. The first 200 meters or so you go down is called the euphotic zone, which is lit by sunlight, but beneath there things begin to get murky. Between that and 1,000 meters is the twilight or dysphotic zone, where there's far less light. And then beneath there is the aphotic zone, which is a region of eternal darkness. The abyssal zone, which is between 13 and 30,000 feet, or about 4 and 6,000 meters beneath the surface, accounts for around 83% of all oceans in total, and it's got temperatures between 36 and 37 degrees Fahrenheit, or 2 to 3 degrees Celsius making this the largest but least explored ecosystem on the planet. This lack of light has massive implications for how organisms function, as without sunlight, photosynthesis can't happen, and this means that the bottom of the food chain is very different from that of ecosystems at the surface. Instead of plants, bacteria that live in hydrothermal vents or in cold seeps are the main producers, converting chemicals like hydrogen sulfide into energy, which is a process known as chemosynthesis. As light is non-existent, many deep-sea organisms have developed ways to navigate using alternative means. Some have large, sensitive eyes that have adapted to detect bioluminescent signals, while others, such as certain species of fish, have completely lost their eyesight and rely instead on other senses like smell and vibrations. Bioluminescence, too, is an amazing adaptation to this lack of light, and around 90% of deep-sea creatures are thought to produce their own light through that process. This is used in a number of different ways, from attracting prey to deterring predators and even finding mates. The high pressure in the deep sea has had a major impact on the physical structure and physiology of deep sea creatures, as at the greatest ocean depths, pressure can be more than 1,100 times that of the surface, which produces an environment where traditional skeletal structures would just be crushed. To overcome this, many deep sea organisms have adapted a softer, gelatinous body that can withstand those pressures. And there's also very little food available at depth, while most of what's available comes from the marine snow, which is a slow drizzle of organic particles that fall down from the upper layers of the ocean. Because food is so difficult to find, many deep-sea organisms have adapted to survive long periods without eating. Deep-sea predators, for example, have often large mouths and expandable stomachs, which allow them to eat prey that's much larger than themselves. And finally, there's a little understood effect called deep sea gigantism, which sees some species grow to much larger sizes than would normally be expected. Thought to be a result of the cooler temperatures, the fact that there aren't as many predators to worry about, higher levels of oxygen in the water, and various other reasons, this has led to a number of peculiar and frightening discoveries. It's because of these reasons, then, that deep-sea creatures can seem so otherworldly compared to what we're used to, and in effect, they do live in a very different world than us. It's time to meet some of the strangest of all. Let's take a look at the vampire squid. This is a frightening deep-sea creature that looks the way it does because of a number of adaptations. Its Latin name translates to mean vampire squid from hell, but in many ways this is an unfair reputation. They typically live at depths between 2 to 3,000 feet, or about 600 to 900 meters, where oxygen levels are extremely low. And there's barely any light. The vampire squid survives in this habitat by slowing its metabolism and using hemocyanin, which is a copper-based molecule in its blood, which efficiently transports oxygen in conditions that would be inhospitable to most other creatures. This animal has elements of both squids and octopuses, but belongs in its own biological group the order Vampyromorphida. This order is different from other cephalopods because the animal's unusual body structure and feeding habits. With a gelatinous body and large, luminous eyes, which are the largest relative to body size of any animal, the vampire squid can detect even the faintest glimmers of light in its dark surroundings. 
Now, one of its more unusual features is that cloak-like webbing, which connects its eight arms. When threatened, the vampire squid uses a defense mechanism called pineapple posture, where it can actually turn itself inside out and display this webbing to make its body appear larger and more dangerous. At the same time, it reveals spiky formations on the underside of its arms, giving it an intimidating look without any actual risk of aggression. Now, unlike true squids, the vampire squid doesn't have ink sacs for defense, and instead it releases a cloud of bioluminescent mucus that's filled with tiny, glowing particles to confuse predators. These vampire squids don't actively hunt prey and instead are passive feeders, mainly surviving on a diet of marine snow. To capture this material that falls from higher parts of the ocean, they have two long, retractable filaments covered with mucus that particles stick to. Also, the bioluminescent ability of the vampire squid go far beyond just defense. Its body is covered in these light-producing organs called photophores, which emit a faint blue-green glow. This serves multiple purposes, such as camouflaging the animal against faint light from above or confusing potential predators. The squid can also control the intensity and duration of this glow, making it one of the most adaptable light producers in the ocean. All right, now let's take a look at the giant isopod. The, at first, seemingly terrifying giant isopod is a deep-sea crustacean that grows to enormous sizes and lives on the sea floor. This large, segmented creature looks like a huge underwater wood lice or pill bug, and they are some of the largest isopods that we know of, generally reaching lengths of up to 16 inches or 40 centimeters, with some rare individuals growing even larger. They're found mostly in the deep Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans at depths between 500 to 7,000 feet, or about 150 to 2,100 meters. At those depths, food can be extremely scarce, so they have to develop slow metabolism and impressive fasting abilities. They can go for long periods, sometimes even years without food, and they're known to eat massive amounts when a meal is available. This feast or famine lifestyle is an important survival strategy for these scavengers, allowing them to cope with the unpredictable availability of food. Now, their segmented armored exoskeleton provides protection from predators and environmental pressures in the deep sea. Their bodies are divided into a number of overlapping plates, which allow them to curl up into a defensive ball when threatened, similar to how a pill bug behaves. This defensive shape protects their soft underparts from potential threats, making them difficult to attack. Their coloration, which is a pale and pinkish white hue, is a great example of the effect of having no light where they live, as there's no need to develop coloration as a form of camouflage. And giant isopods have compound eyes, each containing around 4,000 facets, and they're large and widely spaced, which gives a broad field of vision that helps them spot any movement or faint light signals. They do, though, rely more on chemoreception than vision to find food, using their sensitive antenna to detect chemical signals that are released by organic material. As scavengers, they feed on the remains of animals such as whales, fish, and squid that sink to the ocean floor, but they can too become predators and take advantage of slow-moving or weakened animals that they come across. They are one of the few creatures in the deep sea ecosystem that can consume large amounts of carrion and other materials like this, making them an important part of recycling nutrients and maintaining the ocean floor's ecological balance. Ah, now we're going to take a look at the goblin shark. This bizarre looking shark is certainly one of the most unusual species of shark. It's known as a living fossil. This is a deep sea predator that's remained mostly unchanged for millions of years, dating back to a lineage that first emerged around 125 million years ago. Its strange appearance, particularly its elongated flattened snout, needle-like teeth, and strange jaw mechanism make it very different to the sharks that we find closer to the surface. Living in deep water, usually between 900 and 4,300 feet, or about 270 to 1,300 meters, they're thought to swim in the oceans around the world, but seem to be more common off the coast of Japan, where the species was first discovered and named in 1898. Growing up to 20 feet or 6 meters long, they have pinkish-gray coloration, which comes from visible blood vessels beneath their semi-transparent skin, which is a feature that's developed because of their deep-sea habitat, where there's no sunlight. Their long, flat snouts are lined with electroreceptors called ampullae of Lorenzini. These sensors are extremely sensitive and allow the shark to detect the faint electrical signals that are produced by other animals. This is an adaptation that's particularly useful in the dark depths of the ocean where visibility is limited. Once they find prey, they can't afford to miss out on it because it could be a long time until there's another chance, and this is why their jaws look so strange. 
Unlike most sharks, the goblin shark has a highly protrusible jaw that can extend forward and allow it to attack a target with unbelievable speed. When the shark detects potential prey, it shoots out its jaw in an outward motion, almost like an elastic spring, and this snaps shut over its prey with needle-like teeth that can hold on tightly to slippery animals. The speed and force of this jaw are made possible by specialized ligaments that store and release energy as the jaws open, which creates a vacuum that pulls prey directly into the shark's mouth. Awesome! Energy conservation down there at such depths is hugely important too, so goblin sharks are relatively slow moving and rely on a stealthy approach instead of speed. Unlike fast moving predatory sharks, goblin sharks have soft, flabby bodies with small fins, and it's thought that they will simply drift up close to their prey before relying on their fast jaws to finish the job. There is though a lot that we don't know about them because of the deep ocean habitats that they're usually in. There's a huge interest in understanding them more though, and because they're one of the few shark species that have remained relatively unchanged over millions of years, they are hugely valuable for scientists studying evolutionary history. All right, now we're taking a look at the anglerfish, probably the most famous of all the deep sea species. It's mostly found in the dark depths of the Atlantic and Antarctic, where they've developed some frightening adaptations to survive. With a large head, toothy jaws, and a bioluminescent lure, there's around 320 known different species, each of which lives in a slightly different environment, but all of which are aggressive carnivores. Most are found in the deep sea, but some can be found in shallower waters, instead blending in with rocky environments where they can remain camouflaged. Now, their most well-known feature is that bioluminescent lure that dangles from their head. This fishing rod structure is called an ilicium and extends from the anglerfish's dorsal fin before ending with a glowing tip that's known as the esca. The light in the esca is produced by a symbiotic bacteria that live in that specialized organ and create a blue or green glow. This lure serves as a highly effective hunting tool, attracting smaller fish and other prey in the pitch black depths. And when curious creatures approach the light, mistaking it for a smaller, easier meal, the anglerfish strikes, capturing its prey with powerful inward facing teeth. They've got large, flexible jaws that can extend to swallow prey nearly half their size, and their stomachs are just as flexible, allowing them to eat huge meals when food is available. This is particularly useful in the deep sea where meals can be few and far between, and to be certain they can take advantage of every opportunity. Their sharp teeth curve inward, meaning that once they've gripped onto something, it's virtually impossible to escape. While it's their lure that they're surely best known for, deep sea anglerfish also have another frightening adaptation that isn't so well known, and it's the way that they reproduce. Every image you've ever seen of an anglerfish is of the female of the species, because with these fish there's a huge difference between them and the males. The largest are known to grow up to 39 inches or 100 centimeters long, but the males are just a tiny fraction of that. When a male finds a female in the ocean, he immediately attaches himself to her body and then fuses to her skin and bloodstream through an irreversible process. Over time, the male essentially becomes a parasite drawing nutrients from the female and providing gametes whenever she's ready to reproduce. Most female anglerfish will end up with several males attached to them in this way, making certain that they'll always be able to reproduce when they're ready. It is a grim but important process that's developed, as the deep ocean is so empty that there's virtually no chance they'd ever meet up with a mate during their fertile window if things worked in any other way. All right, how about the Japanese spider crab? I don't like this one. This is an incredible example of deep sea gigantism and is the largest known species of arthropod on Earth. They can grow to have leg spans of up to 12 feet or 3.6 meters from claw to claw with surprisingly small bodies at the center, which are usually around 15 inches or 38 centimeters in diameter. They do look frightening, but Japanese spider crabs are not actually aggressive at all, and they're scavengers instead of being active predators, spending their days foraging along the sea floor. They're found in the Pacific waters surrounding Japan, particularly near the islands of Honshu and Kyushu, and they live at depths between 160 and 2,000 feet, or about 50 and 600 meters, where temperatures are cool. It's not easy to find a continual supply of food down there though, and this has led to them developing an extremely slow growth rate and long lifespan, with some being much older than 100 years, making them one of the longest living creatures in the ocean. The crab's enormous size is an adaptation that helps it survive in the challenging environment, with long legs that allow it to cover areas in search of food while using very little energy, which is vital for survival where food's hard to find. 
Their scavenging is crucial in the marine ecosystem as they help recycle nutrients by consuming matter and maintaining the cleanliness and balance of the ocean floor. Their habitat means that we don't know all that much about their behavior, but there is one particular thing that they do that's strange for animals as big as them. Although their size provides some defense, they're not immune to attacks from larger predators like octopuses, so to avoid detection, they use their claws to pick up seaweed, sponges, and other debris from the seafloor and attach it to their shells, which help them to camouflage and blend into their surroundings. This type of camouflage, which is called decorating, is something that's seen elsewhere with smaller crab species, but it's rare for a creature as large as this to do the same thing. How about the fangtooth? That's a good name. The fangtooth fish is probably one of the most frightening looking of all, and it's a small, highly adapted predator with some of the largest teeth relative to body size in the whole world. With large, protruding teeth and dark, almost pitch-black skin, they're perfectly suited to the shadowy environment of the deep ocean. I guess it's just lucky that this particular species only grows to a length of around 6 inches, or about 15 centimeters. They live in some of the deepest parts of the ocean, depths ranging from over 650 to 16,000 feet, or 200 to almost 5,000 meters. And living in such extreme depths where sunlight doesn't reach, they've adapted to the low-light environment with several unique features that help them survive. Their dark coloration provides excellent camouflage, meaning they blend in with the surrounding darkness. Hunting, of course, relies on those ridiculously large teeth, which are so big that they hardly even seem to fit in their mouth. In fact, the teeth are so huge that the fang tooth has evolved a special pocket in its upper jaw for them when its mouth is closed. But this extra effort is worth it. These massive needle-like teeth are very effective in capturing prey in the deep. With such sharp teeth, they can just snatch and impale slippery prey like small fish and squid and make sure that they won't escape. But with so little food available, fangtooths are opportunistic feeders with a varied diet. They'll eat anything that they can catch, from small crustaceans to fish and cephalopods, and their strategy for hunting relies on quick strikes and their sensitivity to movement. And while they do have small eyes which limit their vision, fangtooths have adapted to rely heavily on their lateral line system, which is a series of sensory organs along the sides of their bodies that detect vibrations. This enables them to sense movement nearby, giving them an advantage in an environment where even a slight disturbance in the water can lead them to their next meal. Let's take a look at the barrel eye fish, which is also called the spook fish. It's a small deep sea species that's become famous for its transparent head and tubular eyes. Growing up to 20 inches or 50 centimeters long, they're found at depths between 2,000 and 2,600 feet or about 600 to 800 meters, mainly in the warmer waters of the Pacific Ocean, and they've evolved some strange adaptations to survive in the dark. The weirdest of all are those tubular eyes, which point upwards inside its transparent head. This structure allows it to capture as much light as possible, which is vital in the deep sea, where there's very little sunlight. The eyes have large lenses that collect faint light, and this allows the barrel eye to detect silhouettes and bioluminescent glows above it. At first, the eyes were thought to only allow upward vision, which raised the question of how the fish could detect any prey in front of it, and further research discovered another strange ability of the fish, that it can actually rotate its eyes forward, allowing it to look directly at potential food sources. But that transparent head, which is filled with a clear fluid, gives a number of advantages too. It protects the sensitive eyes from particles and debris in the water and may also help the barrel eye detect more light by reducing the scattering effect that skin and scales would otherwise create. As for their diet, the barrel eye fish mainly hunt small jellyfish, zooplankton, and small marine organisms that float through the water. When it sees a potential meal, the fish swims towards the target and rotates its eyes forward to track the prey as it approaches. This unique feeding strategy allows it to detect prey in a highly challenging environment where visibility is limited. It is one of the few species that doesn't actually produce its own light too, but it takes full advantage of other bioluminescent organisms, using their light to help navigate through the darkness. The bioluminescence from jellyfish and other organisms not only shows where prey might be, but it can also help avoid predators spotting their shadows before they've attacked. All right, let's take a look at the Riftia. Riftia pachyptila, which is more commonly known as the giant tube worm, is a deep sea creature that's been discovered to live in one of the most extreme environments on the planet, hydrothermal vents. 
found along the Pacific Ocean's mid-ocean ridges, particularly near the Galapagos Rift, these worms thrive around the boiling, mineral-rich waters that are released by these hydrothermal vents, where temperatures can exceed 600 degrees Fahrenheit or 350 degrees Celsius and are full of toxic chemicals. These Riftia can grow up to 8 feet or 2.5 meters long with a red plume that extends out from a protective tube-like shell. Now, this plume is not for breathing in the way that you'd usually think of, but it's designed to absorb the chemicals that are needed to sustain its bacteria. The plume contains hemoglobin, which gives it that red color, and it plays an important role in absorbing oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon dioxide. Those compounds are then transported to the bacteria that are in the worm's internal organs, where they become the fuel that's used for chemosynthesis, which is a process that converts those inorganic compounds into organic matter, which is food for the worm. This is a clever adaptation that's only seen in Riftia and a few other organisms that live around hydrothermal vents. The bacteria that use hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals that would normally be toxic to most organisms to produce organic molecules through that process, the Riftia then absorbs them and allows them to exist in a place without sunlight or any normal food sources. The discover of them in the 1970s completely changed the biological and ecological understanding of life on Earth. Until then, scientists believed that life could not exist without sunlight, let alone in places with such extreme pressures and toxic water. Riftia indeed showed that life could in fact thrive in the most extreme conditions, and this hasn't only changed the view of where else life could be found on Earth, but also where it may exist elsewhere in our solar system, such as on other planets or moons like Europa and Enceladus, where hydrothermal-like conditions might exist beneath their icy surface. Let's take a look at the gulper eel. Well, they're also known as the pelican eel. This is a bizarre species of deep sea creature that's most recognizable for its oversized mouth, which can expand so wide that it's able to swallow prey that's much larger. Living at depths of between 1,600 and 9,800 feet, or about 503,000 meters, they live in some of the most remote parts of the ocean and have evolved a series of traits that make them perfectly adapted for that environment. The most obvious one, the mouth, is loosely hinged and capable of opening so wide in order to help them eat as much as possible, and it's probably this that's allowed them to survive in the deep sea in a way that other eels haven't been able to. Surprisingly though, when its mouth is closed, the eel's head appears extremely small compared to its long body, which can grow up to three feet or just under a meter long. The eel's tiny, underdeveloped eyes are also a strange adaptation and seem very little compared to the rest of its body. Unlike most other deep-sea fish whose eyes are adapted to maximize the available light, the eel's eyes are not particularly suited for clear vision at all. Instead, they're adapted to detect faint traces of light. As it lives in near-total darkness, it relies less on sight and more on its other senses to locate prey, including its highly sensitive lateral line, which detects those vibrations and movements in the water. The gulper eel does, though, have a whip-like tail, which is long, flexible, and normally has a bioluminescent organ at the tip that glows with a soft pink or red light. This organ is thought to be used as a lure, attracting potential prey towards the eel's mouth in the darkness. By flicking its tail or emitting pulses of light, the gulper eel can tempt smaller creatures towards it where they're more easily captured. Scientists believe that the gulper eels are solitary animals floating in the darkness and conserving energy until there's an opportunity to feed. This low-energy approach helps them survive in an environment where prey can be rare and where conserving energy is vital. The Mega Mouth Shark. That's another rare, bizarre species in the deep sea. It was first discovered in 1976 when one was accidentally caught off the coast of Hawaii. Since then, fewer than 100 confirmed sightings have been recorded, making it one of the least understood sharks of all. The most dominant feature of the Mega Mouth is its massive, gaping mouth, which can open to a width of over 4 feet or 1.2 meters. Now, unlike sharp-toothed jaws of most other sharks, the Mega Mouth is adapted for filter feeding, similar to other large filter feeders like the Whale Shark and Basking Shark. It is, though, much smaller than them, usually reaching a length of 16 feet or 4.8 meters, and inside that large mouth there's hundreds upon hundreds of small, hooked-like teeth that are arranged in up to 50 rows, and they're not used for biting, but instead for trapping prey like tiny plankton and small shrimp. Now, the Mega Mouth has an unusual filter feeding method, which sees it swim with its mouth wide open, allowing water to flow in and through the gill rakers, which are comb-like structures. Once the Mega Mouth has collected enough food, it closes its mouth, which traps the prey in there to be swallowed. 
Now, this feeding strategy requires very little energy, which is ideal for an animal that spends much of its time in the deeper, colder parts of the ocean. Another strange behavior of this shark is that it migrates vertically throughout the day, something that's known as deal vertical migration. During daytime, it generally stays at depths between 400 to 1500 feet, or about 120 to 500 meters, but at night, it rises to shallower depths close to the surface. This migration allows the megamouth to increase how much food it can gather, and researchers think it has even more success by having a bioluminescent lip lining, which is produced by tiny light-producing organs. But these sharks are so rare that we know very little about their shark behavior or breeding patterns and even population numbers. Unlike many other sharks, which are often caught in fishing nets, the megamouth's deep-sea habitat generally keeps it out of reach of humans. We have no idea how many there are, or even whether they're in all the oceans or not, which means there could well be plenty of surprises about them to come, and potentially many more similar species that are yet to be discovered. Let's look at the viper fish. Well, this is a horrifying deep sea predator with long needle-like teeth and a bioluminescent body. They're found at depths of up to 5,000 feet or about 1,500 meters, where sunlight barely even reaches. It's a great example of the extreme adaptations required to survive down there. They are, though, relatively small, reaching about 12 to 24 inches or 30 to 60 centimeters long in length. They've got a set of needle-like teeth that are so long they don't fit within the fish's mouth and instead curve back, almost reaching the fish's eyes. These teeth help the viper fish impale and hold on to slippery prey, which is an essential adaptation down there, where meals are rare and losing one can mean waiting days or weeks for another chance. Along its belly, the viper fish has light-producing organs called photophores, which create a blue-green glow that blends with the dim light filtering from above, and this bioluminescence has several benefits. First, it acts as a camouflage against predators looking up from below, as the light breaks up the fish's silhouette and helps it to blend in with the faint light from the surface. More importantly, the viper fish uses a bioluminescent lure at the end of a long dorsal fin spine to attract prey, and by twitching or flashing it in front of its mouth, it can trick small fish and crustaceans into swimming close enough for it to strike. Once it impales its victim, the viper fish's jaws lock down and its backward pointing teeth ensure that the prey can't escape. It is an energy efficient and effective technique, especially in the deep sea environment. But again, because they live so deep, we don't really fully understand their life cycles, but it is thought that they migrate vertically in the water column, coming up to shallower depths at night to hunt, and they're returning to deeper waters during the day. This does mirror the movement of smaller fish and crustaceans that rise towards the surface in search of food when it's dark, giving them a much better chance of finding something to eat as well. How about the Praia Dubia? Well, the Praia Dubia, which is also known as the giant siphonophore, it's easily one of the strangest animals that are found in the ocean. It looks like a single, extremely long creature, but it's actually a colonial organism, made up of a number of specialized individual parts called zooids that work together as a single entity. These zooids are interconnected, forming an organism that can stretch up to 130 feet or 40 meters long, making this one of the longest animals on the planet perhaps even longer than that of the blue whale. They're found at depths ranging from 2,300 to 3,300 feet, or about 700 to 1,000 meters, in oceans around the world. Some zooids are responsible for capturing prey, others for digestion, and others for movement or reproduction. Although the zooids are genetically identical, they are specialized for different tasks, and each one is dependent on the others for survival. This division of labor, as it were, is highly unusual and unique to siphonophores, making them one of the most complex life forms in the ocean. Their bodies are divided into two main parts, the pneumatophore and the siphosome. The pneumatophore is a gas-filled, balloon-like structure at the top of the siphonophore, which helps it remain buoyant in the water column. Below this is the siphosome, which is a long, flexible stem that contains the functional zooids. Along the siphosome, zooids responsible for feeding, digestion, reproduction, and movement are arranged in organized clusters, working together to sustain the colony. They are bioluminescent, too, and create a mystical, faint blue glow. This light helps them attract prey and deter predators. When threatened, the siphonophore can release a series of bright flashes to confuse or frighten predators, allowing it to escape. And the prey-catching zooids, which have long, stinging tentacles similar to those of jellyfish, paralyze small fish and crustaceans that come too close. 
this type of hunting is done passively, and the structure drifts slowly through the deep ocean, allowing its long tentacles to spread out like a fishing net and capture any unsuspecting prey that encounters this colony. Let's have a look at the squid worm. I almost said Squidward there, but the squid worm is a strange deep sea creature that essentially combines features that are usually associated with worms and squids. Only discovered quite recently in 2007 between Indonesia and the Philippines, they have an alien-like appearance and are adapted to live in the mesopelagic zone, which is a dimly lit region about 2 to 3,000 feet, or 600 to 900 meters below the surface. Reaching about 4 inches or 10 centimeters long, they have soft, segmented bodies. Now, unlike most other worms, though, this squid worm has 10 long, flexible structures that reach forward from its head, some of which are larger than its body. They look like the arms and tentacles of squids, but unlike squid tentacles, they aren't used for grabbing prey, but instead are sensory organs that detect chemicals and changes in the surrounding water. Essentially, they are the squid worm's way of seeing what's around them in dark water, both to find prey and to avoid predators. These creatures also have bristly hair-like structures called kete that cover their bodies. These are used for movement, allowing the squid worm to swim with an undulating motion through the water. Their mouths are made up of a specialized feeding apparatus that includes jaw-like structures and smaller feeding appendages. This allows the squid worm to gather and eat marine snow that falls down from the upper layers of the ocean. Squid worms, like many deep sea creatures, are also bioluminescent and they produce their own light through specialized cells that create a faint glow. But the exact purpose of this is not entirely clear because it isn't used to hunt prey, with current theories being that it's to help communicate with others, attract mates, or to confuse potential predators. All right, we're taking a look at one with the coolest name, coffin fish. It's a species that's mainly found in the waters around Australia, New Zealand, and parts of the Indian Ocean, at depths ranging from 650 to over 2,000 feet, or 2 to 600 meters. Known for having a round, bloated body and large head, which gives it a somewhat horrific toad-like appearance, they're usually pinkish or purplish in color and have rough skin covered in tiny spines. The coffinfish's body structure is an adaptation to the high-pressure, low-energy environment of the deep sea, as its puffy appearance helps it to conserve energy, and it has a mostly gelatinous body that requires less muscle mass to move, allowing it to float with little effort. Growing up to 16 inches or 40 centimeters, they have a sit-and-wait approach to feeding, similar to that of an anglerfish. Instead of actively hunting, it does remain stationary on the seafloor waiting for unsuspecting prey to come within reach. This fish also has a small lure-like structure called an esca on top of its head, which it wiggles to attract smaller fish. This lure mimics the appearance of a small, easy meal and brings the prey close enough for the coffin fish to make a quick strike. As they're relatively small, they're also at risk from larger predators and have had to develop mechanisms to protect against this. The main method is by inflating its body when threatened, in the same way as a puffer fish. By taking in water, the coffin fish can swell to nearly double its size, making it appear much larger and more intimidating to potential attackers. This sudden inflation also makes it more difficult for predators to swallow or bite into the coffin fish, which increases its chances of survival. But perhaps the strangest thing about this species, though, is how they see. They have eyes, but these are quite underdeveloped and really don't provide clear vision. So along with these, they actually have small, light-sensitive cells across all of their skin, which can detect the faintest traces of light in the otherwise dark environment. They also rely heavily on their sense of touch and the ability to detect subtle changes in water pressure and movement around them, which let them know where prey and predators are. And finally, the Yeti Crab. Well, this is a very strange species of deep-sea crustacean that was named because of its hairy, almost fuzzy appearance. It was first discovered in 2005 near hydrothermal vents in the Pacific Antarctic Ridge, over a mile below the ocean's surface, and in a place where superheated water filled with toxic chemicals emerge from the sea floor. The Yeti crab's claws and legs are covered with dense bristles, or setae, which are actually covered with filamentous bacteria that thrive in the nutrient-rich waters. The Yeti crab farms these bacteria as a food source and then waves its claws through the vent's mineral-dense fluid to help the bacteria grow. This behavior of farming bacteria is highly unusual and shows a symbiotic relationship between the crab and the microorganisms. Living near hydrothermal vents presents a number of challenges, particularly because of the extreme temperatures and high concentrations of toxic substances. 
Yet the crab is adapted to survive in these surroundings with specialized respiratory and metabolic systems that allow it to tolerate conditions in a way that most other animals can't. As they're so specialized, Yeti crabs don't really move very much and spend their entire lives around the hydrothermal vents. They use the warmth from the vents to maintain an ideal temperature, balancing between the freezing cold of the surrounding water and the superheated vent fluid. By swaying their claws in the vent flow, it helps increase the bacterial growth on their setae. They completely remove the need for hunting or scavenging in a traditional way, which would be energetically demanding in an environment where other food sources are hard to find. So let's wrap it all up with the various different conditions found at those depths having resulted in species finding unique solutions to the challenges that they face, from ways to hide from dangers to methods of hunting that have far higher success rates. We only know of just a small fraction of the creatures that probably live deep in the oceans. So while things may already seem strange and bizarre, further research is only likely to reveal an even more alien-like ecosystem than we could possibly imagine. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.